All right, we're going to go get started with the meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission. Thank MJ. you, Chairman, members of the Commission. Your first item is to conduct your first citizens' participation period. This is the first time set aside for public comment. Uh, please step forward to the microphone, limit your uh, time to three minutes, state your name. Um, and this is for items that are on today's agenda. There'll be a second opportunity um, for any other matters. So please state your name and identify what item on the today's agenda that you're speaking on. You, 1637. I'm here on behalf of, uh, we all are aware of the shooting that happened on our coach uh, last Friday. You know, it's upsetting, and that was a call that I didn't want to receive. You know, it's sad when we go out there, we're driving these buses, we don't know what's going on in the back. Bullets flying. When I went out there, that driver was so shook up. I mean, this man was in tears. He was so frightened. He said, I don't know if I'll be able to sleep at night, you know, thinking about this. You know, bullets going through windows, and you got a baby fighting for her life, you know? You got kids coming on the buses with guns. Everybody has a gun. We don't know who's legit and who's not. But where is the safety for our drivers? Who care about us? You know, we go through this every day. You see on the news, you see uh, this person's wanted for shooting this person on the bus. Have we ever saw a, a wanted person that assaulted a bus driver? We don't see that on the news. When we have a driver to get attacked, we don't see that person's face that's wanted for attacking this bus driver. We just get overlooked. Nobody has our back. You know, it's sad that when we go to work, we don't know if we're going home. I feel for that mother that had to get that call about her baby, you know, in the hospital fighting for her life. What does it take? We're not only fighting for ourselves, we're fighting for the community and the public that rides these buses. Something needs to be done. It's getting bad out here. It's getting worse and worse every day. Someone needs to step up to the plate and have our back and have some concern and compassion for our drivers because I don't want to get that call where that bullet hit one of my drivers. So we're reaching out, we're begging like we do every month for help. We need some security. These buses are 60 feet long. We don't know what's going on in the back. That bullet could hit one of us. We need some help, please. Somebody, please help us. Thank you. Dennis Hennessy, bus driver. You guys all know me. I'm up here every month almost that I can be. I'm here today kind of speak just like Sandra did before the meeting starts and that I hope in your agenda that you're talking about the numbers of incidences that, that the public gets to know in the last month and every month what the incidents were. Guess what? I was an incident a month ago, exactly the same time your meeting was last month. I was assaulted off the bus by a passenger. I'm on blood thinners for other issues. I could have died. I got a broken sinus cavity bone, and I went two weeks with not being able to control the nosebleeds. But guess what? You guys don't care. You know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of hearing statements about this project is going, we've got this million dollar camera system, we've got this driver system. They're all there, but just tell us when they're gonna be done. Just tell us when they're gonna be done. Mrs. Goodman, Tick, I'm tired of seeing you guys on TV saying how supportive of transit police you are. Where were you six months ago before the legislative session ended? You weren't there because nothing was gonna be, get changed. There was no plan on getting transit police. And again, transit police aren't gonna put bodies out there to fix it. Transit police are gonna put consequences out there. There have been no consequences. I'm tired of hearing people say, well, it's this way here, they got transit police there. Our problems here are created by you by no consequences for 13 years and no action, and now we can't get anything done. And you know the sad thing is? I, we, the, our drivers, we, can't, we have no outlet. We can't get an attorney that'll take you on. You're the ones that handle security, but we don't work for you. So guys, the karma train's coming, and it's got litigation all over it. I hope you're ready, because I know you guys don't care. I know the staff doesn't care at least in actions. And MJ, I hate to tell you, but how I feel being assaulted, I could have died last week or a month ago. I could have died. Do you care? No. 
I heard him at the, at the RTC Security Committee meeting, which I have since resigned from. I heard a man I respect greatly make the following statement. Ron Williams, he made the following statement, that he's come to the fact that he doesn't lay awake at night dreaming about being shot when he's driving. He's now resigned to the fact on his own he's going to die being shot. Yet we're given nothing to help us. We're giving no vests, no PPE. The driver doors are, are plexiglass that can be ripped off easy and don't even go to the ceiling. So bottom line, you guys don't care. Good morning. My name is William Lynn. I'm a Las Vegas transit operator. Same thing on security. Less than, what, Friday, I was verbally assaulted for 20 minutes because I chose not to say something from Bellagio all the way to the uh, Premium Outlet on everything from my race, ethnicity, gender. This person was doing everything they could to entice my situation. To, these drivers are going through it every day and everybody wants to say, oh, 99% of it's the fare box. Or, oh, but when somebody's reaching around these little glass things right here that you call protection and throwing them at people, throwing stuff on people, um, throwing rocks that are breaking, and like you said, you can easily rip this down right now if you wanted to, let alone on a bus. They're even more flimsy. They ain't even got bolts. We get tape. We don't get bolts. We get double-sided tape. That's what holds ours together. So um, we've had the 109. Lack of service is causing drivers that are getting, they had a gun pulled on, on the bus less than two days ago. Everybody's just running off of that bus onto the next bus. And guess who's running on there too? The same person that just pulled a gun on that bus. You have marksmen that won't come to, to the routes. You got any route that's running under 50%, especially if you're talking Maryland Parkway, Flamingo, Spring Mountain, who are already on major detours running down on paddle. Uh, and yet you tell them, hey, put marksmen out there or put the buses together going down the street. Nobody wants to hear that. Oh, we can't get marksmen. Well, you guys can get marksmen to ride those buses. If there's a route that's running under 25% of capacity, then it should have a marksman guard on every bus. Somebody to deter the situation. Because at a certain point, even us, we have a safety clause. At a certain point, you're sending those drivers out knowing what's going to happen. To the point where your supervisor's like, well, pull out when you want to. Or, hey, take it when you got to. This doesn't make no sense. Uh, we just got to figure out something. Everybody knows I'm for transit police. I'm not going to deny that fact. But we know that's easily three to four years out from now. It's not going to play it. Um, the security doors, I haven't seen nothing on it. Hopefully there'll be something on it. This, because people are easily reaching around, reaching through, throwing stuff at people. Changes has to come. And the idea that the majority of this is that operators are bringing this on themselves. Well, my tape is already being downloaded 715 to 754. You can feel free to watch it. I made sure it's downloaded. That person is on bus 153. Attacked me the whole way. And as mad as I was, I let him get it the whole way. How much abuse should the driver have to take? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Justin Jones and members. Uh, uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her have been away for a while. I, I have some agenda items here, uh, kind of small print. Uh, paratransit buses uh, that we're going to buy. Uh, very, very, very important. Uh, I mean, I, I am not paratransit qualified, uh, but, but I know some who are, and you never know if, if something could change. So we want to make sure that we get uh, these paratransit buses and make sure that we continue to showcase paratransit. And one way to do it is, is through uh, these, these new buses, which I think will help to uh, improve our service, uh, continuous improvement, if you will. And then there are some other miscellaneous items lower down in the agenda. The audit, we're going to hear about audit. And I don't know much about audit. I've been to a few 
audit meetings in my life. Um, uh, that, that's important, and, and we've done very well with audit over the years. I've been speaking at these meetings what, since, I think, 2009 or 2007, I'm not sure. So we, we're, we're doing well. And, and this evaluation committee for CEO is, is, is very important uh, because it is always essential for you as a board who gives direction through your collective actions that you pass at your public meetings uh, to maintain communication uh, with your CEO. And I, I have here, uh, I, I'm a little familiar with APTA, and um, I know some people on the APTA Board of Directors. Uh, MJ here is Vice President of APTA. Uh, this is a very big deal. Uh, so uh, I've never been to any APTA meetings because I think most of that is for members. But APTA brings their things to us here. So th that's very important for this committee to maintain the communications so that your policies will be implemented. So all I have to think about is opening up my app and getting on the bus and getting to the other side. That's my agenda item message for today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pree. Anyone else wishing to provide public comment with regards to an item on today's agenda? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the first public comment period. Back to you, Ms. Maynard. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, the next time is to approve your agenda. It's in order and ready for your approval. All right. I'll entertain a motion. Aye. There's a motion to approve today's agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. So we'll move on to the CEO report. So I, you know, you, you've heard in the media uh, lately a lot of conversation around um, just how difficult it is just to drive in and around the resort corridor, uh, F1, the construction impacts, uh, and we certainly talk about uh, how difficult it is for anyone that's driving, for any of the, the, the transit customers, but I, I think what is not brought to light enough is that for the drivers it's very, very stressful. Um, particularly the five routes that are impacted by F1, and I thought we, uh, I certainly wanted to recognize uh, their efforts because uh, the paratransit drivers that drive all over the city are greatly impacted by what's happening with, with the major events, as are the, the drivers, uh, the fixed route drivers and the mechanics. And so uh, I just wanted to let them know that, you know, they are, they do the hard work, they represent us, they make us look good, they are crucial in moving nearly 50 million passengers uh, here in, in Southern Nevada every year. They're the ones that are getting people to where they need to go, to school, to work, to uh, medical appointments, it's really to the essential services. And I think when uh, we're hearing that the services is not where it needs to be, we know that our, our drivers, the drivers, they get a lot of the feedback and it's very, very stressful on them when they've got customers getting on board the bus that are angry because the bus didn't show up or it was late or it's overcrowded. So I wanted to take a moment to thank the operators, both paratransit and the transit driver, uh, fixed route operators and the mechanics and the support staff of MV and transit because again, they're the ones that are, that are doing the, the hard work and I just want them to know that we appreciate them. Thank you all for uh, all you're doing. I know it's a challenging time out there and we, we appreciate it. We, we, do, we do care here on the board. So we were going to move on. Uh, this brings us to an individual recognition, uh, Bus Operations Center Specialist Nikisha Henderson. And I'm going to uh, turn this over. Actually, Chris Cole, our deputy CEO, is the one that presented this uh, to Nikisha. Thank you, MJ. This month, we are thrilled to recognize Bus Operator Center Specialist Naka Shaw, or Nock Henderson, for her dedicated efforts to assist operators. Nock deals with a wide range of calls assisting operators who are feeling lost, anxious, or simply in need for someone to talk to. Operators and team members shared that she is able to calmly maneuver in any situation, including keeping her shift mates and operators calm until the necessary help arrives. On behalf of, of the RTC and the Board of Commissioners, thank you, Nock, for keeping our buses running safely and smoothly every day. Surprise! Congratulations, Nakashaw Henderson. 
And on behalf of the RTC and the board, we just wanted to thank you for your hard work and dedication. Congratulations. I really appreciate this. Years of service, I've dedicated my life to you. <laughs> I want to thank everyone at RTC, trans staff, here, my little cousins, I call you all. Thank you. I appreciate this above and beyond. <laughs> Is not here. Oh, stand up. Thank you. And next, we would like to recognize three gentlemen from Marksman Security uh, Commander Smith, Officer Fisher, and Officer Gergazi. And to present this item, we also have Chris Cole. Thank you, MJ. We are recognizing not one, but three marksman officers today, Officer Fisher, Officer Gorgesi, and Area Commander Smith. Recently, the team was working a late night shift at the Bonneville Transit Center when the officers noticed an argument between three individuals began to escalate. These officers sprang into action and de-escalated the situation, removed the instigator from the property and called Metro, allowing passengers to continue to board safely. On behalf of the RTC and the Board of Commissioners, we want to recognize this amazing team for their attendance and keeping our customers safe. To surprise them with their awards today, Safety and Security Director Tom Atterbury went to the BTC. Let's watch. Gentlemen, Tom Atterbury, I'm the Director of Safety and Security for RTC. Good to see you. Good to see you again, Devon. On behalf of the RTC and CEO, MJ Maynard, and the entire executive staff and the Board of Commissioners, I want to recognize you guys with an award for the great work you did and uh, protecting the public and doing a great job for RTC. So we've got a couple of awards for each other, Officer Gorghizi, Officer Fisher, and Officer Smith. Congratulations. Congratulations, guys. Well deserved. Just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, this is very unnecessary. We're just doing our job. But uh, once again, thank you. I appreciate you guys for the recommendation. Um, this is the best thing I can ever have. Uh, I just, just do my job every day I can do it in the best way I can do it. Just want to say thank you again for the awards. Um, we're just here to do our job. I got a fine set of individuals here. And as long as I got these two on my side, we're going to make everything happen for you guys. Very good. Are the, those fantastic officers here? No. There they are. Amazing, amazing uh, individuals. Well deserved recognition. Oh, look. I should have said, surprise. <laughs> Next, we'd like to recognize our superstars of the quarter. Um, our first superstar is Melissa Shampo. She is the administrative specialist for our paratransit department. While Melissa is always organized, helpful, and responsive over the last few months, she has also jumped in to help two other departments who unexpectedly needed staffing support. She quickly learned new procedures and tasks of the new departments while also completing her regular assignments. So really, she really stepped in. We had a staffing shortage, and she did a lot. We really appreciate her for it. We're very grateful for Melissa. And so please help me congratulate Melissa. Come on, Shana. Surprise, Jack Giese. Uh, he's our second superstar of the quarter. Jack is the government affairs administrator. And I'll tell you, he is a key member of our government affairs team, working on everything from briefing materials and information for each of you, uh, to legislation and grant efforts on a state and federal level. Specifically, Jack spent four months earlier this year traveling back and forth to Carson City, working with the legislatures and RTC stakeholders on several transit and roadway funding issues. And he was instrumental. Uh, he, he did a lot of hard work. Uh, he's an amazing uh, young man. In addition to helping get bipartisan support for Assembly Bill 359, which would have authorized Clark County to extend fuel revenue indexing, Jack was also instrumental in the RTC's efforts to get $5 million in state funding to support transit through Senate Bill 341. Prior to SB 341, Nevada was, the, was one of only four states where transit 
did not receive any state funding. So thank you, Jack, uh, for all your hard work and dedication. Uh, and I really, congratulations, where's Jack? Take a bow, Jack. Okay, and you know, this is another uh, opportunity to, to talk about what a great staff we have at the RTC. Every year, the Nevada chapter of the American Planning Association honors excellence in planning projects through their DeBoer Awards. So I'm happy to share that this year, our planning team won the Outstanding Public Outreach and Journalism Award for the Southern Nevada Heat Island Mapping Campaign. The RTC was one of 14 locations across the country selected by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to conduct an urban heat island mapping campaign. More than 60 volunteer, quote, citizen scientists use sensors on their vehicles to identify the hottest parts, pockets of our valley. Data from the study is helping support and inform heat mitigation activities, including tree plantings and the placement of new slimline transit shelters. I'd really like to uh, recognize Paul Gulley. He's the principal transportation planner who led this effort for the agency. So thank you, Paul, and the planning team for all your work. Is Paul here? Where's Paul? There you go, Paul. Paul, you might have to stand up again, because Paul was also the author of a grant application recently selected to receive $2 million for the reimagined Boulder Highway project. Regional Infrastructure Accelerator grant funding will cover the environmental clearance and preliminary engineering phases on the northern sections of Boulder Highway within the city of Las Vegas and unincorporated Clark County. The Nevada Department of Transportation, thank you, Tracy, will fund the remaining project costs for this portion of the project, and this work will lead to enhanced transit operations and increased safety along one of the deadliest and busiest corridors in the metropolitan area. I also want to thank you, Chairman Jones. Um, you know, you, you connected us with the Build America Bureau, and you, you continue to encourage us to really take a hard look at, this, at grant opportunities like this. So thank you for, for your leadership. Um, this is going to be a big deal on Boulder Highway, the beginning of something that, again, will improve safety. And so uh, thank you. Appreciate it very much. And on November 1st, the RTC unveiled its first four battery electric buses alongside NV Energy and the Nevada Conservation League. The addition of battery electric buses comes on the heels of our August launch of two hydrogen fuel cell electric buses, furthering the RTC sustainability goals to provide and improve air quality for residents and visitors of Southern Nevada. Special guests included Congressman Dita Titus and RTC board members who celebrated our commitment to a sustainable future. Mayor Hardy almost drove the bus away had to put, we had a hard time getting him out of the driver's seat. He enjoyed it so much. So thanks uh, to the board for all of your support. Really appreciate all of you. And so now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Deputy CEO Angela Castro to brief you on our transit safety campaign that we'll be updating by the end of the year. Ange. Thank you, MJ. Uh, for the record, Angela Castro, Deputy CEO with the RTC. Board, as you know, we continue to prioritize safety of our passengers and operators through investments in our transit system. Um, in the last three years, thanks to your support, we've invested more than $33 million to install higher resolution cameras on every bus, upgrade the technology to allow for um, enforcement to look, law enforcement to look into the bus in real time. We added 33 armed security officers and doubled the number of security vehicles to our patrol system. We know that we need to work at all levels, from additional investments all the way down to how we communicate with our passengers. Uh, so we recognize we can't stop there. So today, uh, to help bolster these efforts and engage our passengers to help keep our system safe, we're excited to unveil an updated transit safety campaign. In recent months, our team has interacted with our transit riders and bus operators to better understand where improvements can be made to bridge the communication gaps in bus etiquette, safety protocols, and overall rider experience. We've used this valuable feedback to refine our campaign messaging and added a touch of humor for a more engaging approach. So while this may seem small, communications with our passengers is critical. And I would like to invite uh, Scott Robertson with Robertson and Partners to share the campaign with you today. Good afternoon, Chairman Jones and members. Um, this was a tough one for an ad guy. <laughs> We're used to promoting things like rapid transit, and hydrogen buses, and all this fun stuff. And public safety is a very, very uh, big challenge for society in general, and more specifically to our transit system. Um, so we took it very seriously. We went out and interviewed hundreds of passengers with staff and dozens of operators who are on these buses every day and said like, 
you know, what, what can we do to help the situation? Because we can never guarantee public safety, right? That's a promise you can't make in, in sort of marketing campaign. But so we're like, well, what can we do? We can and do make you safer every day. And we do it through a number of initiatives. What we want to do is just get out there and let the public know what we are doing. And then also let the operators know that we're listening. And then also talk to the passengers and say, hey, can we, public safety is everyone's business. Can we involve the passengers and the, who use our buses every day in sort of participating in creating a culture of safety, if you will. So, uh, you know, advertising and marketing it can't guarantee safety, but we can make you safer, sort of where we landed. Um, and we do it, we have safety you can see, you can feel, and you can touch. We have the security guards, we have the shelter lighting, and we have the transit watch app, which people can download to report crimes on the buses, report unsafe behavior, they can ask for response, and it demonstrates to the general public, our customers, that we are in fact listening and engaging and trying to solve this problem for you. Um, it's difficult to stand up here, and I know how much you guys care about the community, uh, your operators, uh, the, the passengers, and I, I know what you're doing, so we want to make sure people know that. So we came up with a simple campaign. It's not a big mass media campaign. It's a owned media campaign, which is to say it's on media we own, on our buses, on our shelters, and inside the buses, targeting the users daily, right? And we don't have to make a big investment. It's two different uh, bifurcated audience. One is the general public for broader awareness of what we're doing. Um, it, we're watching, we're listening, and join us. And the second one is specifically to passengers and operators with the goal of creating a culture of safety on the bus. And essentially it says, you know, safety is everyone's business. And uh, the ads we created, I just want to mention, we went out with 50 odd messages to show operators and passengers and say, does this resonate with you? Uh, would this affect your behavior? And they ranked these and we ended up with about seven, eight messages. The highest ranking ones that everybody says, yeah, that, that helps me. And some are to operators, some are to passengers, and I'll run through them. So they would be like this in the bus, just so everyday people getting on and off the bus are exposed to a message from us. With the badge, Everyday Safer, um, our commitment to safety, and a call to action to download the RTC Transit Watch app. And the messages are simple things like this. Uh, Dear riders, you don't have to be a superhero to fight crime. Just download our app. We're listening. Um, Dear riders, not all heroes wear capes. Download the app and help keep our system safe. So that's more of a direct call to action to a rider. Um, then you get into messages like this. We want people to know we're filming them. We want people, would be bad guys, to know there are videotapes being made every time you get on this bus, so hopefully we can go get after that guy who was verbally abusing the guy who was attacking you. Um, so, dear riders, your character is judged by how you be behave when no one is watching, but just to be safe, we're filming everything. Uh, dear riders, we're all in this thing together. Literally, please be a part of the solution, not the problem. If that's too much to ask, smile, you're on camera. Um, a little uh, word to help drivers as well. Dear riders, welcome aboard. Where you go is up to you. How we go is up to all of us. Make your mother proud today. And to this point, she mentioned a little bit of light humor. One thing when we test messages, it's been proven that government authoritative messages to consumers, things like just say no, will usually make people say yes or do something bad. So the conversational, personal messages, talking to people like they're your friend or family, part of society, really resonated with people. Um, try to be a rainbow in someone else's cloud. If that's too much, don't rain on anyone's parade. We want to create a culture of civility. Just like at home, at your office, or wherever you go every day, the bus is a place for civil, civil behavior. Um, dear riders, our entire system runs on drivers. Please treat them as you wish to be treated yourself, or consider walking. Like, hey, we're not here to take your abuse, man. You can, you can hit the pavement and pound sand. Um, bus drivers don't make the world go round, but they do get you to your next stop. Be nice. It's simple, basic things we're going to ask every day that our, our mother would tell us to do when we leave the house. Um, Dear riders, please have cash payment, mobile tickets, or, mo or payment. We do not accept BS. Um, you know, there's always people trying to con their way on the buses or, <laughs> uh, or excuses. So, um, and then we want to put these banners on our buses outside so that the riders and the would-be bad guys understand everyday safer every day. Everyday safety is a sec. It's not like we can guarantee safety, but all the things we do every day are there to ensure that you're safer than you would be if we weren't doing all these things we're doing. And in fact, I should note, it's not gonna like solve anything, but during our research, we uncovered that, you know, it's a societal, it's a national problem. Las Vegas, your transit system has three times fewer incidences um, than the national average. I mean, still we have some problems, but like we should recognize that we're doing something right. So safety is everyone's business. 
Um, these are in the bus shelters, every day safer. Safety is everyone's business. See it, feel it, touches. We have cameras and guards, bus stop lighting, and a mobile app. With RTC, we're safer together. Download the Transit Watch app. See something, say something, download the Transit Watch app. So now everyone on these riding these buses every day knows, okay, somebody's thinking about this, we can be a part of it. And maybe somebody, when someone's yelling at somebody, some other passenger on the bus might step in and say like, hey, give that guy a break. We'll see, baby steps. Um, so here's how it might look in the real world. Bus is pulling up to the stop, signage here. And then of course in social and PR, we won't be doing this, but there's gonna be other ways for us to tell our story to the general pro uh, public in terms of investments we're making in security and downloading the app. And that's it in a nutshell. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. We appreciate your creative messaging. Any comments from the board? I had a couple. Um, is this going to be in Spanish also? Yes. And I couldn't tell. Were you able to put sorry. your camera and just download the app? Or is there a barcode that's going to be there? Or what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear this. Looking at, the, at this, I couldn't tell. if Can you just point your, your, your phone at these boxes and download it right there? Yes. Yes, it's a QR code. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I think it can help align where you're sending marksmen based on, like, hey, where are we getting reports, what, what routes, and things like that. So. Councilman Knudsen. Thank you. I just had a question. I just downloaded the app, and I'm just curious if I were to submit something, who does it go to? When you download the app, it, it goes to um, the marksman security, and also to the, I believe it also goes to the BOC as well. So it's, it's double. Both, both people get the incidents. All right, any other comments or questions? Um, oh, Councilman, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I really appreciate um, you guys taking some steps. Uh, they seem like they're simple steps, but uh, sometimes the message is not getting out. Uh, the common denominator in many of these instances, right, are youth. Hmm. Um, the young man who shot I mean, not even supposed to have a firearm, Fif you know, 15 or 16 years old, shot, then dumped the gun, and the little kid uh, mm -hmm. matched through themselves. Just uh, over the last few weeks, uh, if we just look at uh, the incidents of violence, um, on, on Halloween, a uh, suspected teenager shot another one during, uh, while they were trick-or-treating. And again, that young man, there's no way he could be licensed to carry. He was a, a teenager. Um, in my city, I'm very happy to hear that uh, the murder of one 17-year-old, our cops made, uh, our homicide cop made an arrest. But they didn't have to go very far to look for him. The young man was already in juvenile hall. He's 14 years old. My school today is in mourning. Why? A young man lost his life reportedly over a vape. He was beaten down and ultimately die. There's a video out there. The violence that uh, unfortunately is spit, uh, uh, we see on our buses is something that's out there and it's real in our communities. It spills into our schools, not because our schools cause it. It spills onto our buses, onto the bus stops, not because they're inherently dangerous places. It's because they're transitional spaces and the violence spills onto them. You can put as many cops as you want out there on the street, but they're reactive. This is a proactive thing that you're doing. Uh, I, I think that's a, a really good thing. Uh, small, uh, but um, I would suggest, uh, I, I think we still need maybe a few more things to, to reach the younger set, right? To, uh, if we could actually uh, make like a TikTok video, an Instagram thing, right? Extolling why we want safety. On top of that, right? I think we also need to reach out to the families. For instance, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that the families of these, and most of these young men who have these firearms had no idea their kids were packing. As a parent, when's the last time that you guys actually checked your kid's backpack? Checked your kid's clothes? Ask them, where are you going? Who are you with? I think we need a, a campaign also to reach out to the public and ask them to do things, you know, like parenting again. We can't stop everything, 
but the message needs to go out. And, and I, I would suggest, you know, again, um, we have creative teams, you know. There's young people, we could probably get, um, we're, uh, one thing that, uh, that uh, Jack and I, we're big time Raiders fans, right? I'm sure we could get some uh, players from the Raiders to join us in a program to promote safety. Get some, uh, someone from the Golden Knights. Ask them to go and promote this thing with us. We ask what we can do. Again, we can, you can hire as many cops as you want. It's not gonna stop some kid who doesn't care about how many cops there are and challenge our cops. What we gotta do is we, you know, we have to take control from the very root. Getting the message out, you know, it's a little uh, message, that, that, that's a really positive step. But I would, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, humbly suggest that we need to go maybe just a little bit deeper as well. You're doing a good job, and I, and I do appreciate that. And I do appreciate the fact that we have more, uh, more uh, uh, marksman guards out there. I ran into a couple of them over here on Eastern. Uh, they didn't know who I was. I went in and introduced myself, took a couple of pictures, right? Said, hey guys, thank you for being out there. And they were recently hired. You know, they, they had only been on the job for a couple of weeks, and I was really happy to see them in pairs. You know, it, was, it was a couple, uh, uh, and that's a really good way to, to have them. Um, I, I, I see them all the time. When I'm, get, when I'm leaving um, uh, City Hall in North Las Vegas, on, on, on North Las Vegas Boulevard, I see them all the time. And on, I, just, I don't know, maybe it's where, where I live, where I see the guys more. But then again, I've also had to make phone calls. I've, I've had to call the 911 for incidences that I see at the bus stop. And again, you know, just, they're transitional spaces. You can't cover them all. But I think we can all do just a little bit more uh, to improve safety. But a lot of it's gonna have to do from the public. If you're a parent, check your kid's backpack. Check the room. Tell your friend, tell your, your brother, tell your sister-in-law, when was the last time you checked Lupa's backpack? Do it. You might find stuff that you have no idea what your kids were into. Thank you, Councilman. We appreciate your raw emotion there. It's important. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, the next item uh, on, on the agenda is to receive the Nevada Department of Transportation Director's Report from Director Tracy Larkin-Thomason. Thank you, MJ, and good morning, everyone. So we're going to start off with, uh, on our side, a couple of uh, achievements. Um, for the Mount Charleston emergency repairs, these were the results of damage done by uh, the tropical storm Hillary. So on SR 156 Lee Canyon, it reopened October 26th. 13 areas were repaired, including removing and repaving 300 feet of damaged roadway. That was at a cost of 1.5 million. The second picture, the one in the center, is SR 157 Kyle Canyon. It reopened last Friday. 39 areas were repaired, including removing and repaving 3,300 feet of damaged roadway, six miles of shoulders graded and compacted. We added additional drainage features, and then we armored the shoulders with boulders and cemented it to guard against future flooding. That was at a cost of 4.5 million. The last one isn't quite done yet, SR 158 Deer Creek Road. It, we are anticipating an opening later this week, though, on Friday. We removed 700 feet of guardrail and 400 feet of damaged road. And as you can see from the picture, we've had to re literally go down 50 to 75 feet of excavation to find the existing pipe and prepare for a new pipe um, alignment. And that cost was 4.25 million. I wanna give a big shout out to uh, my crews, the contractor, but also to the Mount Charleston residents and Clark County and the first responders because they were tremendous in just the partnership and working with us on that. So thank you. Um, SR-166, uh, again, this was also damage done by the uh, tropical storm Hillary and then the same series of storms later in um, over Labor Day weekend. So this was mainly done on the shoulders, uh, the medians, and the drainage areas. And this should be complete later this month. Um, the top row shows the before, so the initial areas that were flooded and damaged, and you can see just an incredible amount of uh, 
really around the state. It's just an incredible amount of damage done to the drainage areas. Anyway, the original approved contract was for a maximum of two million, but we did have to upgrade it to 2.75 million because it was much more extensive. And again, uh, we thank for all the collaboration that we've had with that. Now, with F1 coming up next week, so just a little preview of what we're actually, the configuration that of the Tropicana project is. There will be, if you look at the left-hand photo, there is no northbound to I um, no northbound I-15 to westbound movement, but there is an additional westbound Tropicana lane. There'll be three total from I-15 through Polaris, and then headed eastbound. There's three total from I-15 through New York, New York. There's no restrictions on northbound I-15, so it'll be returned to the full five lanes between Tropicana and Flamingo. Um, following F1. This will be the uh, configuration until uh, the Super Bowl. So, di well, just prior to the Super Bowl, the southbound off ramp and the northbound on ramp will be closed, but the southbound on ramp and the northbound off ramp will be open. The east and west movements will be in the diverging diamond interchange configurations with two lanes in each direction and three lanes westbound starting west of I 15. The area in orange. Um, is the area under construction. So I was talking to post F1 there. Uh, it will be the double, diver double diverging diamond interchange uh, through the Super Bowl. And then on my next slide, I'll show you some of the plans for the Super Bowl. Whoops, one too many. So when we look at here, this is a configuration that will be started through the Super Bowl. It will be, we say starting February 3rd, but basically it will start as soon as the north structure is finished, so it might be starting a few days earlier. And then it will hold that um, February 12th, it will hold it through the Super Bowl to the Monday after the Super Bowl. All ramps will be open with some limitations. There'll be no left turn lanes from the off ramps, so you have to go right to go left, so there'll be some U-turns. That's because of the differential in elevation between the two structures. The Harmon HOV ramps will be open, and the I-15 southbound to eastbound flyover will still be closed. Um, and this will be a more traditional, this won't be the double diverging, this will be a more traditional straight through going over the, the structures. Now, working with, uh, this slide is for you, Mayor Goodman. So this was to answer your uh, question from the last, um, the last meeting. So when the working with impact businesses, when we do have projects going through, we do contact all the business owners in the areas. Um, if easements are necessary, we do pay fair market value for the property. And then also we do make every effort to reach out and impact the business adjacent to the structures. We try to, uh, a good example would be like the I-15 TROP where we worked with um, like in and out for dedicated hours and days of construction availability within temporary construction easements. So we try to work uh, the best thing to do for the business there. And then we also work with a small business to either create directional or open for business signs for affected businesses that have less direct access. Uh, then the I-15 Charleston project, just to note that uh, the bridge deck and the freeway widening is complete on I-15 between Charleston Boulevard and Eastern and East Las Vegas. The bridge deck pours are complete over Mojave, Stewart, and Pecos. And the crews will begin shifting lanes on I-15 to make way for permanent widening. Um, and some of the lane shifts on there had been delayed because of utility work but we do remain on pace for substantial completion by fall of 2024. And for all updates on this project in English or Spanish, please visit www.i51charleston.com. And it is on the slide there. And that completes my report. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Larkin-Thomason. Um, any questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you for all of your efforts. Um, we know next week is gonna be challenging, but we're all in together. <laughs> Thanks, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, the next item is to approve your consent agenda, which consists of items 5 through 33 and can be taken in one motion. I'll entertain a motion. Motion, motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Chairman. The next item, uh, agenda number 34, is to appoint an evaluation committee to assess the performance of the Chief Executive Officer for the period of January 1, 2023 through December 31, 2023. All right, I will make a motion to appoint uh, myself, Vice Chair, and Councilman Knudsen, and uh, Mayor Goodman as the alternate. All's in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Great. Uh, the next uh, agenda items 35, 36, and 37, uh, our Chief Financial Officer, Mark Trostow, is going to handle those agenda items. Thank you, MJ. I would like to introduce uh, Brad Shell. He is a partner with Crow CPAs who will give us a report on this year's audited uh, audit reports of our financial statements, our grants, and also FRI. Well, thank you and good morning, uh, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Brad Shelley. I'm an audit partner with Crow uh, and our firm's transportation leader. Uh, we work with many public transportation agencies across the country and uh, I'm proud to serve RTC and I'm happy to be here to briefly uh, go through the results of the, the audit process. Uh, so there are three reports to cover, uh, which are agenda items 35 through 37. Um, as part of that, we were engaged to uh, perform a few services. Uh, one is audit the basic financial statements. Uh, two is to provide a single audit, which covers the uh, federal grant expenditures uh, during the year. And then the third is to perform agreed upon procedures related to the uh, fuel revenue index. Uh, so I'll start with item number 35, the audited component unit financial statements. Those are your, uh, essentially your basic financial statements. Um, just a reminder here, management is responsible for the preparation of the financial statements. Uh, our responsibility is to provide an opinion on those financial statements based on our testing. Uh, we do provide an unmodified opinion again this year, uh, which is the highest level of assurance that we can provide, uh, essentially a clean audit opinion. Uh, one thing that you'll note within the independent auditor's report is an emphasis of matter paragraph. I uh, just wanted to point that out. Um, that is specific to the implementation of a new accounting standard this year, GASB 96. Uh, there's no impact on our audit opinion from that, um, but because there was a significant impact on the financial statements, that's included within the audit report. Um, from a financial statement standpoint, um, assets and net position both continue to trend in a positive direction. Uh, that's primarily a, a result of the continued federal dollars uh, that you've received. Um, and then also you had some uh, pretty significant increases in, in both the fuel and sales tax revenues. As I mentioned, there was one new accounting standard this year, uh, GASB 96, that's uh, referred to as SPEDAS often. Uh, it's subscription-based information technology arrangements. And uh, essentially, as a result of that, you recognized about $3 million of subscription asset and liability. Uh, so no net impact from that. It really just kind of grosses up your balance sheet for those. Um, and that's similar to, if you recall from last year, GASB 87 related to leases. Kind of the same concept, uh, but just for a different type of arrangement or agreement. Um, there are additional disclosures on that in notes one, two, and 10, if you're interested in more of the accounting uh, jargon related to that. Uh, the second item, uh, agenda item 36, is the single audit. Again, this is related to uh, the federal grant expenditures during the year. Uh, for this audit, we provide two audit reports, a uh, GAS report, uh, which is government auditing standards, and a uniform guidance report. Both of those are clean audit opinions and no instances of any non-compliance. Uh, the GAS report, ref, uh, report uh, covers the financial statements uh, under government auditing standards. The uniform guidance report covers the uh, compliance and controls related to the uh, major federal programs. Uh, this year we had to test two major federal programs. Uh, so every year we test the federal transit cluster, which is where the bulk of your federal funds come from. Uh, this year we also had to test the highway planning and construction grant. Um, and those two grants comprised all but about $100,000 of your federal grants. So over 99% of your federal grants were subject to testing this year. Um, as you may have noticed within there, you spent the last bit of the ARPA dollars this year, so that, that kind of is the rest of your COVID dollars. So as you move into FY24, no additional COVID dollars remaining there. Um, and as I mentioned, no internal control issues and no compliance findings based on our audit procedures. The last agenda item is item 37, and that is uh, the fuel revenue index results. Uh, based on the completion of our agreed upon procedures, uh, there were no concerns or exceptions noted based on our testing. 
uh, all fuel revenue index uh, revenues were properly accounted for and the funds were utilized for board approved uh, projects. Um, as I close, just wanted to mention a few things. Uh, as I said, I'm our firm's transportation leader, work with a lot of public transit agencies across the country. Um, and, and really a lot of the issues that we're seeing are the same things uh, that you're seeing here. Um, some of the things, same things you're being talked about, right, from a security standpoint, um, but also from a, you know, needing to get more employees, both operators and non-operators continues to be an issue. Um, the federal funding and that running out, the COVID dollars running out has created some long-term long and in some cases short-term financial concerns for some agencies. Uh, so those are a couple things that we've seen and just the, the impact on those or potential impact on services. Uh, for RTC, what I wanted to point out is that a few positives in here is, one is that you had very little COVID dollars in FY23. There was about $13 million left for this year that we're reporting on, so you'd already spent most of that. Um, and you were still able to continue to increase service. Uh, so I think that's a positive trend as we look at some of the other agencies who are struggling, still have a good amount of federal uh, COVID dollars and are still trying to deal with potentially decreasing services. Um, the second thing is ridership is strong. Uh, from what I can tell from the NTD, the National Transit Database numbers, ridership has been anywhere from mid-70 uh, 70 to low 80s uh, percentage compared to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, which is at or above a lot of the national ridership levels, so uh, strong ridership levels there, uh, which is good to see, and obviously that helps bring in uh, additional fare revenue as well. The last thing I'll point out from that standpoint, from a financial standpoint is, and I, I know I've mentioned this in the past, obviously I have a lot of debt on the, on the county planning side of things, that's the way it's structured, um, but on the public transit side, you don't have any debt. And that gives you a lot of flexibility, you know, as you move forward into the next year, two years, and long term, uh, to make changes as you need to based off of ridership, based off of pandemic concerns, anything along those lines. So I think that's a especially positive thing. Just wanted to point that out, uh, and really just a lot of positive financial trends for RTC. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention was just to uh, specifically call out the uh, RTC finance team. Uh, Mark Trosdall, uh, Sherwin Gutierrez, I don't know if Lisa is here, I know some of the, uh, the finance team members are here today. Really appreciate all of their assistance throughout uh, the, the process. They continue to not only be prepared for the financial statement audit and the single audit, um, but they're also leaders from a public trans uh, transportation finance standpoint. Um, we conduct roundtables, we have meetings, you know, you're involved with APTA. Um, and they continue to be heavily involved. They are sharing uh, things that RTC is doing, trying to learn what other entities are doing from a financial standpoint, from an accounting standpoint, and so really just continue to do a good job there. Um, and I think this year especially was challenging. As I mentioned, we had two major programs we had to test. That's additional requests uh, that we provide and ask them for. Um, they also had to work through a new accounting standard, as I mentioned. There were some delays with some of the OPEB information coming from the county, so that was a kind of a last minute thing, trying to work through that and get the accounting for that, so. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you to the entire team, we appreciate that. And I actually, I wanna close on one comment. I was making this comment the other day with uh, Mark and Sherwin. Uh, their abilities, their efficiencies, um, their um, being proactive from an accounting standpoint and, and providing the request actually saves RTC money in the way of audit fees at a minimum because we are able to keep our audit fees lower because we're able to perform the audit efficiently, effectively, and quickly. And so I think that's something to be commended. Not, that's not always the case with all of our clients, um, unfortunately, and uh, they do a great job with that. So I appreciate that. And uh, that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Thank you very much, uh, and I, I think we all echo sentiments that uh, Mark and your entire team are fantastic, and we appreciate that you are lifting up the next leaders within your department. We'd love for you to be around forever, but we know that's <laughs> not gonna happen, so. Um, uh, any comments or questions from the board? All right, can we take this as one motion, or we do three separate motions? Yep. 
there's actually nothing to approve. It's just for okay. receipt. All right, sounds good. So received. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to share one of you and your team if you could stand up really quickly because you they burned the midnight oil for weeks and weeks. Great, great team. Mark, thanks for all your, your, your leadership. You're, you are amazing. I'm going to lock him up. I don't want him to ever leave. Okay. Uh, Gen Item 38, uh, commissioners, is to receive information from our legal team. There are no items to discuss, so we move on to your last agenda item, which is to conduct your final citizen's participation period. This is the second time set aside for public comment. Anyone wishing to provide public comment uh, with regards to any issue before the Regional Transportation Commission, please step forward to the microphone, state your name, and uh, keep your comments to three minutes. Sir. Good morning, Stanley Smalls with ATU International. I believe I came to y'all last month um, and made y'all aware of the conditions with Silver State. Um, as I recall, um, you guys didn't ask the owner to come before y'all and lied to y'all. He willingly did that. He assured y'all that he was working with the union and he wasn't threatening the workers. I wanna make it very clear. I have pictures, I have documents on everything I'm about to tell you. That day in that meeting, he had his own union buster here. We didn't know that until the next day when some of the workers called um, one of the gentlemen that's real, that they, uh, they confided in, that there was a guy there posing to be a member of the Amalgamated Transit Union, telling them they're with the union, don't vote for the union. Since then, they have told workers that if you join this union and you vote the union in, we are leaving. You'll be out of a job. They have made, these, these folks are very fearful. Just yesterday, while the election is going on, uh, Mr. Albert and their general manager, um, Yvette, was standing by the door um, watching the voters come in and some of them were scared. One young lady actually ran from them and panicking because she was scared and Yvette was quoted telling her, I'll see you in my office on Monday. Um, I don't know which one of them did it, but we got the pictures. They leaked the international staff payroll to their workforce. This is not working with the union. This is creating a, a crazy hostile environment. This, you know, then they altered a document stating that one of our, our chapters in Chicago, the president makes $700,000 a year. Um, this, this is the foolery. Um, they, have a, they have documents all over their, their office saying that the, the union is a trillion dollar industry. Boy, do I wish. <laughs> Boy, do I wish. But these are the things that they're telling people. They're telling the workers, if you join the union, you're gonna have to pay union dues from the day you worked, or you're gonna have to give your hard earned money. I don't know about anybody up here, but $13 an hour for cleaning a 60 foot bus is not no hard earned money. That's slave wages, right? This is a union town and we shouldn't be accepting this kind of behavior from these folks. You guys have done great by them. Those folks, like I said, should be able to choose whether they wanna join the union, whether they don't wanna join the union. We've been very quiet. We have, we have a plethora of information, even from the fact that the general manager is using uh, Transdev P card to fuel her own vehicle. We know these things, but we've been very quiet about it. All we are asking them to do is stop threatening the workers. They sit today, today at the Sunset Yard. They're sitting in the office while the workers that get off of work, they have to clock out. They have to clock out to go vote. They have to walk by them, right? So these people, they get the last word on them. When we was going through this process, we asked them, hey, listen, let's have this election at this time and could you give the workers a minute to go vote? No, but yet alone, they let a guy posing to be a union person come on the property, come on the property and talk to people, but you won't let these folks vote while they're on the clock, right? They, these guys, uh, just last week, they have, no, yesterday, they have told the marksmen that you guys, the RTC has given them the right to park their vehicles on the ground, their lawyer, who was asked to identify himself was told, he told the marksman, you guys gave him clearance to the property. You cleared him to be on the property. He hasn't checked in. He walks around and he tells them, you guys have cleared it. The marksman has walked me all around the property. They forced me to give my ID to them. They took a picture of my ID for me to be on the property. I've been treated 
truly unfairly, but I'm being told by these guys, you guys are giving them this type of clearance to do this stuff. Um, and this has to stop. Thank you. Um, can we go to Ms. Jones? Good morning. I have a positive comment and I have a negative comment. Positive comment, I really like Silver Ride. I like USERV, RTC On Demand, which is also known as Tango, which that's what I call, and I like paratransit. Now on the negative, to the gentleman that was the second, I, I believe, who spoke about he was being assaulted, where was the security to help him? I know for a fact that you guys, if it was somebody in your family or even you, would you do something about it? Why didn't you help him? This is wrong. You guys are terrible. Other than that, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Next speaker. Yes, uh, Council. I appreciate your time. My name is Chris McHale. I'm the attorney for Silver State. I've been practicing labor law for over 28 years. When I came out of law school, I worked with a law firm that represented unions. I've dealt with unions. I've represented them. I've been representing management for the last couple of years. Um, I could assure you that the statements you've just heard from ATU are false. I have not told any security officer that I had the commission's um, authority to be there. Okay? The commission asked why I was there. I explained the situation to them, the union election. I was escorted by Silver State. There was no lies made. What I can tell you is, within being in that office, for five minutes, I was verbally assaulted and attacked. I was threatened to step outside the gate and see what happens, okay? I've never dealt with union representation that acts the way this group does. So I just wanted to clarify for the record, there were no lies made about the commission, there were no threats to the employees, and in fact, I've been in that office, and the only papers that are up on the wall our business papers from Silver State. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. I wasn't going to say anything, but William Lynn, Las Vegas Operations, and I don't know what he's talking about, not threatening employees. I speak to a ton of their employees every morning when I'm out there, every evening when I come out, both yards, I make sure to be it. You see me there on my days off, and multiple of them from the ones that wash, the ones that unload money, have told me how they have been being threatened about the situation. MJ, you know I don't tell no, it is what it is. So if we even make that statement, I don't know who he's been talking to, but the ones that come to me, that speak to me, have definitely told me that they are being made feel that if they do vote in any kind of way towards the union, that something will happen to them. So. Um, I also like to say now that I'm up here, um, that they just threw me all the way off. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Lynn. Next speaker. Yeah. Sandra Adams, Vice President ATU. You know, as drivers, we come to work every day and we only want what's owed to us. The company put out a letter stating that if you worked all of your schedule and volunteered to do one of your days off that you would get this bonus. The drivers are fighting to get this bonus. They've worked the, the time. I've been going back and forth with the payroll lady all morning about issues about bonuses. The lady worked four days, her regular schedule. She worked one of her off days. She's entitled to the bonus. She's off three days. Well, she didn't work the second day, doesn't matter. It says work one of your off days and all of your regular schedule. She did that. We're getting our PTO hours snatched away from us that we didn't even put in for. We're having a hard time getting them back. We've been talking about this for over a month. I mean, we, we struggle to get anything done there. Our drivers are still getting treated like crap. You know, just give us what's owed to us. We come to work, we earn that money, give it to us. I shouldn't have to wait and fight for something that I've already earned. You know, it's sad the way 
that our drivers are being treated by this company. You know, they, they got people that they're putting in these positions that don't know what they're doing. They're giving us a hard time. People going back and forth. You know, I can't even have a day off in peace. I'm getting calls starting at 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning throughout the day. Uh, my check is short. They took my PTO hours. These dispatchers are talking to me like I'm trash. You know, we go through all that stuff every day, and they keep saying it's getting better, it's getting better. More staff, more staff. And the people that they're bringing on, they don't know what the heck they're doing. Stop treating our drivers like trash. Respect us. Give us what's owed to us. That's all we ask for. You know, we deserve respect. Because you sit behind a window, that doesn't give you the right to talk to me any kind of way. I'm an adult. Give me the respect that I give you. We address this, we bring this up all the time, and nothing is being done. Everybody wants to meet, especially right before this meeting. Oh, we want to meet, we're going to do this. Nothing gets resolved. We go through this every month. It needs to stop. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Next speaker. Dennis Hennessy, once again, I want to talk about operations now, uh, not safety. I want to talk about operations. And I've been doing this now for 13 and a half years, driving a city bus for you people. I've known MJ for 14 years. Um, this is by far the worst that the public service that the public is getting. Transition, what transition? We're six months in, same thing's happening. I keep hearing rumors, hey, the RTC's going to kick TransDev out. That's not going to happen. You guys know it's not going to happen because through liquidated damages, you guys are fixing, you're on the pace to get back $48 million of the $690 million contract. So you're not going to kick somebody out. They're filling your pockets with cash because they can't run the business. It's a Mickey Mouse run by results organization. Now, are they making attempts? I think Jennifer McKibbins was the right move to put in charge of this system here, but she can't do it by herself. She can't work two o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon every day and not get help. The lack of leadership that was here coming in, they were late getting in, they were behind. You all know the problems. I don't need to remind staff, maybe I need to remind you guys of the problems that are there. The gentleman that did the audit talked about how ridership is up, but yet I could tell you for a fact how many routes are being missed because they can't get relief out there? Not because they're short of cars or they're short. They're short of effective management. Jennifer's going to get it done, I think, eventually. She needs some help. But what you're going to hear at some point in the rest of this meeting, you're going to have somebody from Transdev come up here and say, I'm so-and-so with the company. We're, I'm going to be here until this is solved. Well, guess what? I work four days a week, and I haven't seen anybody here on the ground. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Good morning. My name is Terry Richards. I'm the president of ATU Local 1637. Um, I, I'm sorry I don't remember the gentleman's name that was standing here talking about all of these things that you guys are putting on the bus. But I know you all remember when you came out with the no fare, no ride campaign. If you think about it, that's when all of our problems really began because you gave us a criteria to go by for no fare, no ride, but you didn't give the same thing to the public. He says he interviewed operators and passengers. I ain't never seen that man. <clears throat> he didn't come to the union and say, this is what we're doing. Nobody from here said, this is what we're going to do. We're trying to get with you to get with the employees to see what, how everything is going. I don't, I've, I've never seen anybody be interviewed. And I am going to start asking people if they were interviewed. All I ask is that when you put these things on the buses and our operators and our members start to abide by these rules, that you back them up, not like you did when No Fair, No Ride came out. Because when we start quoting No Fair, No Ride and people got mad, 
we got reprimanded when they called your customer service center and said, the driver is getting mad at me because I'm not paying. Please don't let that happen again. Also, um, I keep hearing you guys talk about the efforts that you're making. Efforts are good. My grandson makes an effort to clean his room every day, but it never gets done. <laughs> so can we please, with our efforts, start making things get done? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning, board. I'm Carolyn, a professional coach operator. Let me stand still, bring this up, because I do wear glasses. I come before you because the public and my safety are being compromised. We now know that liquidated feeds are being imposed on TransDev for their obvious shortcoming and failure to deliver quality service. I do support these measures, but these measures aren't forcing TransDev to come in compliance they are forcing TransDev to receive that money in the form of neglecting safety measures. For example, buses leave the yard and are while in service with bad turn signals, no horn, no heat now, and during the summer, no AC. There is no immediate attention to a mechanical issue while in service. Transdev poor service sometimes place operators in a very dangerous situation. We're asking this board to take action, if not for the operators, for the public, who is the sole reason why we're all here. Thank you. I wanted to say that, but I also wanted to let every one of the board member knows you're welcome to ride these buses. We have board members that are in a Mesquite, uh, Boulder Highway. As a matter of fact, when Jacob Snow was here, he rode the bus every day. Things seem to be running pretty good, but we deal with a lot. And I'm going to go back to the schools. I was talking to a few drivers who pick up some of the high schoolers, elementary and junior high. If RTC can go and talk to those administrators, I pick up Sahara Day Suite. You know, I get them to work, I mean, get them to school, and, and I don't have any issues. But when I was hearing the issues that the other drivers were having, one of our drivers, 30 years, was called the N word and a B word, and we're talking the Hollywood area schools, then you have the schools that are in between, well, on Washington, some of those schools, they're totally disrespecting drivers. And it's not about how we talk to them either, because these are older women with grandkids, like myself. Uh, if you guys can talk to them, it really would be appreciated, because they don't have to be called those names by little ones. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. My name is Bob. I am a driver out of the Simmons Yard. Um, MJ, a couple weeks, a couple months ago, you asked why drivers are calling off. Um, I'm going to answer that directly. We had under MV 500 drivers there. They got 10 hours of PTO a month. We don't really get holidays. That requires approximately 20 drivers a day to call off. We had six slots. That means 14 drivers had to call off just to get their PTO. It was the same thing with regards to vacation. 200 or 500 drivers, two weeks vacation, 20 a time needed to be off. They had six slots. We don't have a contract yet, so we don't know what we're allowed to have. We don't have a good way to, to, to determine how to file for PTO. I had to go ask a whole bunch of questions and find the right person to be able to take three days off. Easier to call in. Hate to say it, that's something that Transitive needs to fix. Um, 
We also, I also want to talk about security and safety for the drivers and what we can do now. Um, we know we all had the shooting. I was actually on the north or the, the east end of Owens when that was going on, so I was close to the action. I wasn't actually in it. Um, there's a lot of violence going on. Uh, we as drivers, we need to help work more on our de-escalation techniques. I know that, but there's also a lot of stuff that gets done and I'm sure at the 50,000 foot level, you guys don't know this, but at the five foot level, we see it every day. Uh, we have buses that came in that still don't run right years later. The 18 series coaches, and during the summer, we cannot drive uphill faster than 12 miles an hour with the air conditioning going. The 17 series, the 16 series, the 15 series, which were all previous years, didn't have this problem. This is a manufacturing change. That means the manufacturer should have been responsible. Your contracting officer should have held them responsible to get it fixed. It didn't happen. Our drivers or our passengers get upset because they're late or they're hot. They don't have a choice in the summer. They're either late or they're hot. They get upset. We're the front line. We get yelled at for this. Okay. The 19 and 20 series coaches, they change the suspension all the time. While we're driving down the road, they're adjusting the suspension. You're going from driving with the left side four inches down. All of a sudden, in, in a second, you, it, it raises the left side and lowers the right side. If we're trying to, to brake because somebody just cut us off, there's no way in the world we could do this. These are safety issues. We're still getting yelled at by the passengers because they think we're doing this. This is all stuff that should have been fixed under warranty. Your, administ your contract administrators, your purchasing people, should have held New Flyer accountable for this, and it hasn't been done. On top of this, Nevada Revised Statute prevents us from stopping in certain places. And yes, I can quote the statutes. Yet, coming out of the RTC was, you need to stop where it's a single lane, you need to stop here, you need to stop there where it's illegal. That has to end. And we all need to work together to make sure we're all, we're all complimenting each other and not blaming each other for stuff. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. And if there are other speakers, if you could please line up at the bottom of the stairs just so we can have a sense for who, how many more speakers we're gonna have. Hello, my name is Natalie. I've been the one uh, helping out with Can you state with your this. last name, please? Natalie Uriarte. And I've been helping out with the ATU sign-on for Silver State. Uh, what they were mentioning before and uh, as one of the people trying to sign on in the campaigning I was handing out flyers when Mark Fernandez was uh, came on property in his personal vehicle drove his truck on property and this is the same person that said he was working with the union started yelling at me to get off property to not talk to his people then he got into his own vehicle sped on the lot the, and the speed limit 10 miles an hour on the on the yard he sped about 25 miles an hour went into the cor corner until he was approached by marksman and I mean, I fear for the safety of my coworkers. This is a yard where we all work. We all have to cr walk across the yard. That's unsafe. And that's one of my main concerns that if they're gonna be driving their personal vehicles onto the, onto the yard, uh, they should at least drive safe and follow the rules. These are unmarked personal vehicles. I mean, nobody else is allowed to park on the yard. They bring their Silver State uh, owners and Yvette, one of the supervisor or management, bring their personal vehicles on the yard. Yvette has even been seen filling up her truck with the company card. She sends the fuelers to go fill up her truck as well, along with you know, all the other company cars. And uh, there's been a lot of threats. A lot of uh, Silver State employees have come to me with concerns that the owner of Albert has uh, been saying up to the point where he will close down the company if the union uh, gets voted in. And he's been threatening them not to vote yes. He, and I even have pictures of their flyers, anti-union flyers that they have in their office. So. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Morning. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm Lisa Fields. I'm a coach operator on a different note. Every year, well, I started last year, I do a blanket drive for the homeless. And I just want to come to try to get permission to put up flyers in your buildings and boxes so I could do my blanket drive for this year. And another thing, I wanted to ask RTC, because I've been seeing little kids, little babies come on my bus with nothing, no hats, no gloves. Could you guys kind of donate some hats and gloves so I can give to some of these children? And on another note, I just want to give uh, over and beyond 
that I come in contact with is my dispatcher, Kiana, for doing a great job. She's always going over and beyond for me. Uh, Irwin is a, um, a manager. He helps and goes over and beyond. Christian and dispatch, Christian and Karen, they always solve my problems. I have no problem with that. And for Jennifer, she always, when she first came, she said, this is my number, contact me if you need anything, need any help. And she's a woman of her word. Every time I've called, she's always texts me right back. So think about what I asked about the gloves and the calves and the blanket drive that I'm trying to do. Please, I would love to have that permission. I would love for you guys to donate for me. Thank you. Thank you for your offer. I'm sure MJ will be in contact. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Bree. Um, thanks again, uh, Chair Justin Jones. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her. Uh, I'm simply an ordinary user of RTC. D don't see many of us coming through here. And, and sometimes it's not easy being here, but I'm here. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I mentioned to you about two weeks ago that I was passed up at a bus stop. Uh, I called it in, not, not going to go into it all here. We've got uh, other things to talk about here, but I did call it in and hopefully I hear back. Uh, it, it should not happen. If the bus is full, then the bus full sign should be turned on. But it shouldn't happen in broad daylight when they can see me. Anyway, enough said about that. Um, I hope to uh, ride on the electric bus. I guess um, I'll see if they end up on Sahara or Charleston and maybe they're doing roving routes to come around the neighborhood and uh, hopefully the, the hydrogen bus will be soon and hopefully we don't buy any more diesel buses because I saw that in San Francisco and New Jersey Transit they are buying lots of diesel buses still so uh, at least it doesn't look like we're going to do that anymore. Uh, so we want to stay ahead. And, and the fair payment, um, I'm looking forward to the updates and trying out the new systems when they come out. I heard about the approval of the Title VI, and I'll have to re-watch the videos uh, as I, I've been away. And um, I did get to ride on an electric bus in New York City. There's only 15 of them on the road. Out of uh, 5,800, that's how many buses there are operating in, uh, in New York City, uh, along with their legendary and uh, historic train system called a subway, which I'm sure some of you have seen. And I did pay with my phone uh, many times on, on the subway. And I, I can't speak for other people here, but my resume with public transportation did not start here in Las Vegas. Uh, it started in 1970 uh, at the 34th Street and 8th Avenue station of the New York City subway. And I got on the system and... Um, well, I wanted more of it, so now it's 53 years that I've been with that legendary and historic system. So how can we look to continue our improvements, to consider this idea of some call fair capping, other call accumulators, where you use your card to pay and it knows how many rides you've taken. They do this in New York, and they do it in New York with reduced fare. I only paid a dollar forty-five a trip, so we can do those things here. So I hope to see these things that we're doing come into their fullness, and that electric buses won't be a novelty but commonplace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bree. Next speaker. Ron Williams, ATU shop steward, glorified bus driver. I'm tired, so I just got off work, but I'll be brief. Actually, we said this in a um, security meeting. Um, we need to be, I ain't gonna say that, I won't say motivated. I'm a driver and passenger type person. I try to mend the bond, because there's a big space, I'm trying to mend the bond. And I told people on holidays, you should let the drivers, if it's St. Patrick's, why they can't wear green? If it's a, jersey, if it's a football game, let them wear their, their jerseys. Any holiday, if it's um, the, the cancer, let them wear pink. 
it seems that there's a problem now that we can't do that anymore. So, I, I, and before it wasn't a problem. Now that the new company come over now, we can't wear this, we can't wear that. But they don't understand that when a, a, a customer comes on your bus and they see these things, it, it gives them like, okay, hey, you know. My other thing, you probably can't fix this, but I just did Flamingo. And for the first time in 16 years, I looked at my um, AM, AMT and it said I was 99 minutes late. Something has to be done about this. There's no way in the world I get the traffic. I get this race. But something has to give. That makes no... If you pull my tape, I will give you the bus number. It was 18706, I believe. They tried to kick my back door out trying to get off the bus because I was in traffic that long. They tried to kick, and I was so glad that nobody was smart enough to pull the emergency brake. We're going to have to do something about that. that, that that's ridiculous. I can't really say nothing else because my brothers and sisters said everything. Else. But those are my concerns right now. We need to get the, the morale together. So you got this campaign. This guy said you got the campaign. Yeah, that's fine and dandy. But how about get, go get the driver's T-shirts that say that so the drivers can wear that T-shirt. Hey, smile, kiss your bus driver, something to get that morale together. Let's do that. Hey, a little signs up and thing. Do you know how many signs up in those buses? Only, only sign the customers seem to see is, if you get hurt, call me and I'll get you some money. That's the only sign they really see. <laughs> so get the Java t-shirts, make us, you know, get this bond together. We need this bond. Because remember, we're out there. When everybody, especially me, I drive at midnight. When everybody's asleep, I'm out there. And it's, it's crazy out there. I need something to make these people feel good. Even if I, y'all don't give us water. Give us some water so we can give to them. Or put our water on something. So we can show that, yeah, we do care about y'all. And that's all I gotta say. I'm going to bed. Thank you. Next speaker. Maybe not. Morning, board. My name is Kevin Shiver. I'm the vice president with TransDev. I just want to acknowledge I've heard a couple of the items that have been shared here. I'm aware of a few of the items here, and we are working very closely with the union. We're meeting with all the reps we can and making sure that all the problems that are known are being addressed. I know we're not totally there yet, but there's been a lot of progress made. I want to make sure that's acknowledged. And I do hear what they're saying, and we're working with them closely. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wish to provide public comment? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and, oh, sorry, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> These are my chopped liver. Sorry, you're, I thought you were just getting up. For, yeah. <laughs> uh, Bill Marion, for the record, Purdue Marion Associates. I just want to give a shout out to Deputy CEO David Swallow who was on a panel discussion with UNLV's uh, Center for Business and Eco Economic Research uh, Outlook two days ago. Um, it was refreshing to hear national experts talk about the importance of transit for revitalization of downtowns and for urban economies. It was also refreshing to hear that Las Vegas ranked number one in the nation, congratulations Mayor Goodman, for uh, the economic revitalization rebound for its downtown. It beat every other city in the country. So again, uh, David did a great job outlining some of the efforts that RTC is doing in terms of enhancing transit and the impact that that's going to have not only on our downtown but on our other uh, commercial and business areas. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marion, and thank you, David Swallow, for always being on fantastic panels and explaining all the great work that uh, the RTC does. Any other speakers? All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Melchizedek Christ Nimrod, N-I-M-R-O-D. Now you can find Nimrod in Genesis, the 10th chapter, the 6th of the 10th verse, and you can find Christ in Matthew, Matthew, the 24th chapter. I suggest you'll read that. Uh, good morning, Justin Jones and ladies and gentlemen. Lovely Major Carolyn, Oscar won the Oscar. You. Yes. And a congratulations, everybody, for the uh, new battery electric buses. <laughs> That's a great deal. We thank you. The good people of Las Vegas, thank you for thinking about us. Rockstar MJ, thank you for Nevada's first hydrogen fuel cell electric buses. Thank you and all of your crew. 
Rest of our two familia, I pray for your families. I must take back my, I must take back and rescind my praise for Nathan Goldberg. The walk, don't walk signs on the southeast and southwest corners of Tropicana Avenue and University Center Drive are not working due to a drainage improvement project, he said. I've noticed that drainage improvement project, and they're doing a great job, especially in that triple degree heat <laughs> that was out there. They were boiling, they were cooking, but they were taking care of the business. So they're doing a great job. Now, the apparatus that is set up on each corner is already there, the, the structure to put in the don't walk sign, walk, don't walk sign signals seem to be the easiest part, I think. I don't know, but it looks that way to me. The structure's there, sticking the don't walk, walk signs. Uh, on, November the 20th, on November the 2nd at 7 a.m., there was another car crash at that intersection. Now, was that signage the problem? Did it cause it? I don't know. Also, there are no street lights on Paradise Road between Naples and Tropicana. At night, there are two unlit, unsafe bus stops there in that area, ID 2065 and 2072. Also, the west side of the street is very unkept. It's like the forgotten area, especially at night, it's dangerous. I'm not scared, though. <laughs> Bus 108 misses scheduled times and runs late. Now, there is no reason for that. It's a short route from the, from the uh, Bonneville station to the airport. Bing, bing. No problem. But it's the, the, the bus is either late or doesn't come at all at that particular time. And I'm seeing the other buses like Flamingo and Covo Lane, they taking care of business, zooming all around their detours. There's no detours for 108. Thank you, Mr. Still Nimrod. Late and they don't come. Thank you for listening. Of course. I appreciate your time. <laughs> Anyone else wish to provide public comment? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, adjourn. Thank you. <laughs>